on behalf of the education committee, I want to just briefly say that when we had our first meeting this year at Mike's house, I printed out the vision statement that's in our challengers chat that comes out every Saturday morning. How many uh, have you read that? Have you ever read that? And I said, this is great. Who wrote this? And they said, Bob Lynch. And I thought, well, that makes sense because he's got his heart right where, and, and all of his hearts right where they belong. The last sentence of that vision is the heart of this class is the love we have for each other and every challenger. And it is with this vision that we meet regularly, regularly and move forward through life together. So for those of you who missed class last week, please go watch it on YouTube because you're going to need to see that. But even if you missed it, today's going to make perfect sense because what Dr. Lynch is going to do today is tell us what we can do is stay out of the hospital <laughs> and live a long life. And that means live a long life, not just be old, but live and be active. I'm going to just add a little bit of resume in front of his resume that I mentioned last week. Just this is always amazing to me. He's an Edison High grad, Tulsa kid. Maybe you all already knew that, but I didn't. He went to University of Tulsa, has a degree from there. He went to Oklahoma University School of Medicine, that's where he got his MD. And then he went to University of Oklahoma Health Sciences where he did his internship, his residency, and his fellowship. That is 12 years of preparing to be a physician. And then he went to Thailand, which I mentioned last week, he was chief of medicine and cardiology at the US Army Hospital in Bangkok, Thailand. So we are really lucky to have uh, the, one of the founders of Oklahoma Heart Institute, which is one of the regional centers for making us live a long life. But Dr. Robert Lynch is going to give us part two of how to live a long life. Bob. <laughs> wow, that almost makes me wish I'd prepared something for this. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you, Connie. So. Um, actually, uh, to begin this, I was going to show a uh, slide of a cartoon that Star Barnard sent me this week. And this, the thumb drive is somewhere between Betsy Richards' home and here, so it's not, <laughs> not going to be there. But I will tell you about it anyway. It is a neat little cartoon. It shows a doctor and a patient, and the patient sitting down there, and the doctor says, well, I think it's just, just a paper cut. But let's run some tests to find out for sure. And, and so that, that kind of summarized uh, last week's presentation. It would have saved a lot of time probably. But nonetheless, the other thing is I've all, I'm so impressed with uh, somebody that can give a presentation uh, without any notes at all whatsoever, kind of like David Emery does. So I thought I'd try that today and just see how far it goes. So, Following up on what Connie says, uh, certainly uh, we need to be improving our health, take advantage of, of our health, get informed, be active, and so on. So, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, lifespan in the United States, longevity, in 1900 was 47 years. Causes of death at that point in time were pneumonia, tuberculosis, and diarrheal diseases. And so along come uh, antibiotics, particularly penicillin, uh, and uh, other antibiotics subsequently. And so uh, over time, the uh, length sp lifespan in the United States improved up until 1996. At 76 years of age, uh, longevity peaked. And it stayed about the same, and in fact, in the last few years, it's gone down. In fact, the United States of America is now behind about 60 countries in the world in length of life. And there's some reasons for that, and I'll discuss those and discuss how to, how to combat that. I think that um, it reflects uh, what has been called different stages of medicine. Uh, the first stage of medicine went back to the days of Hippocrates, uh, when it was mainly guesswork, mainly observation without any other specific forms of diagnosis or treatment. And then uh, medicine went into what's called uh, Medicine 2.0, where uh, 
there were enhances improvements in treatment of acute illnesses and injuries and so on. And it's pretty much stayed the same uh, since that point in time. And so we have this issue that uh, length of life is not increasing, in fact, maybe decreasing in the United States. Part of that is due to the epidemic of COVID. Part of it is due clearly to the epidemic of obesity. But prior to COVID, this was a trend that was in place. Uh, there were escalating incidences of heart disease, of cancer, of what are called the neurodegenerative diseases, meaning Alzheimer's and meaning um, Parkinson's. Parkinson's is, is escalating dramatically in terms of its, its frequency and occurrence. And so now the doctor will revert his notes to carry on from here. <laughs> so. What is needed, as you can tell, I said last week and say again this week, is, is a reset in medicine. A reset to where medicine does not uh, respond to acute illnesses, a lot of times treating after the fact or after a disease has become uh, present and it's always at the late stage of the disease, but to shift medicine to reset it toward active prevention and early diagnosis. This has to be uh, medicine in the future because we've made major advances in treating heart disease, for instance. I mean, we can treat an acute heart attack uh, with uh, prompt balloon procedure, stent procedure, opening up an artery that's been closed by a clot. In fact, there is what's called a door to balloon time of 90 minutes. So when somebody would come in with a heart attack, uh, that would be the protocol. And so we made advances in that, but still about 2,300 people die every single day of heart disease. People continue to die of cancer. We made little improvements in cancer management over time. And so that's all an impetus toward a reset uh, in medicine. For cancer patients, uh, too late. Uh, we treat patients after they've been there. Hey, Anka's doing that again, I think. Anyway, after they've been diagnosed, and it's, it's a rather central indictment, I think, of our healthcare system. And Keenan, I promise to get to positive things as we go on, uh, but we'll just outline here uh, where we need to be going. So, um, the odds are overwhelming that we will all die as a result of the chronic diseases of aging. And those are heart disease, cancer, the neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and so on, and what are called metabolic disorders. That includes diabetes, that includes other abnormal parameters of metabolic function in our bodies that I'll talk about. So we talk about trying to increase health span, the number of years that you live, not how long you live. You know, there's no point in trying to live to 120 or so on if you're frail, disabled, not to enjoy life. The idea is to delay the onset of these chronic diseases as long as possible. And then, instead of the typical uh, path, of developing a chronic disease and then ultimately dying as a result of it, that ultimate path will just stay very, very, very healthy up until a very short period of time, which is then uh, the end. So that's really what needs to occur. And just the problem is, problem is, we're intervening for the most part at the wrong point in time, well after the disease has taken hold and often too late. We need to be acting much earlier. So we don't really so far seem to have a handle on how to treat uh, these diseases. I'm gonna talk a little bit as we go on about how to prevent some of these things from happening and how to manage them as early as possible. Uh, here's a few examples of some things that I think that we have. A lot of people are aware of cholesterol, uh, a typical cholesterol panel uh, that you will obtain is often misleading as about as important to you as the color of your eyes, for instance. It doesn't tell near enough about what your risk is from dying of heart disease. And so I'll talk about how to 
assess that risk. We also need to address metabolic health, uh, and I'll discuss that. Protein becomes an important part in our preventive management, and we'll discuss that. That's often not paid attention to. Currently, all diets, for the most part, are pretty similar. They're sort of the same thing for everybody, and there is what's called precision medicine, and we need to identify that every individual is just that, is an individual and not, not necessarily uh, responsive to a blanket form of treatment or uh, recommendation for diet. Well, I'm going to talk a lot. You'll have heard me before, and I'll say it again, because exercise is by far uh, the most potent longevity drug that we have. People who exercise regularly can live up to approximately 10 years longer than individuals that are sedentary or do not exercise consistently. Most people don't do nearly enough, although there's a report that just came out the last few days that talks about that in terms of how much we need to be doing, and I'll talk about that. Abundant research, reams of data, reams of evidence says that exercise-based uh, interventions are the best thing that we can be doing. So we've got to change things. Uh, medicine has not made as much progress among these four uh, causes of death that I've mentioned. Uh, the improvement in the length of life that I mentioned earlier was primarily a result of antibiotics, better sanitation, and that type of thing, as opposed to better medical care. So we need to have a far greater emphasis on prevention than treatment. We need to consider all of us as individuals. We have to understand risk. It's important when analyzing things. What is your risk of developing cancer? What is your risk of developing or having heart disease? Or what, what is the risk if you do certain things, certain tests, certain treatments? What is the risk if you don't do anything at all? So medicine, uh, the new medicine needs to uh, honestly assess, and patients need to honestly assess uh, what the risk is. You know, it's interesting that, that the money in the healthcare system predominantly goes toward active treatment tests, procedures, and so on. And it's amazing to me that Medicare insurance companies would sooner pay fifty dollars or $60,000 for bypass surgery and not pay a physician to spend an hour with the patient to discuss how to prevent the need for bypass surgery. Well, that's just the state of things, and so that's why we need to focus very hard on trying to prevent things. So uh, we need to um, institute this awareness, these steps in terms of exercise, in terms of nutrition. I'm going to talk a lot about sleep because that's becoming recognized as more and more of a health issue. Emotional health plays a role. I'm not going to spend too much time with that. So in the United States of America, we have what's called a crisis of abundance. In the late 1970s, for instance, the average male weighed about 173 pounds. Today, of course, it's about 200 pounds. Uh, more than 40% of the case is obese. Another third is overweight. Obesity is a number one symptom of what's called metabolic dysfunction. Uh, metabolic health is incredibly important. Uh, 20 to 40% of non-obese people are metabolically unhealthy, and um, it's not necessarily about how much you weigh. And, and I'll. I'll advise how to evaluate your metabolic health uh, because that's an important issue. I think that we have, as a result of our um, society with abundant calories, we have a global epidemic of type 2 diabetes mellitus, which basically you can say is a disease of civilization. Today, about 11% of the population, about one in nine in the United States have type 2 diabetes mellitus. You bet. Be sure I'm bringing that back, Hank, okay? <laughs> so, patients, what's, why is this important? Because patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus have a much greater risk of cardiovascular disease, as well as cancer, as well as Alzheimer's. Why is this epidemic happening? Well, our genome, our genes are not equipped, not adapted to deal with the toxic environment that we have with this abundance of calories and abundance of bad food. 
Our environment has basically changed much faster than our genome has changed. Fructose, it's an abundant source of calories. It's present in our diet in a very powerful way. Uh, it is a powerful driver of metabolic dysfunction uh, if consumed to excess. The bottom line, excess calories is at the root of a lot of the issues that I'm talking about. So the new medicine approach would look for warning signs earlier and intervening before these diagnoses happen. So the first thing to do if you're serious about evaluating your metabolic health is to evaluate insulin. Insulin resistance, increased insulin is a driver of accumulation of fat, is a driver of health-related problems, is in itself an endocrine disorder. And so it's a very important issue. How many of you know what your insulin level is? Oh, Larry, yeah. Okay, and Connie, pretty good, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so see what I mean? <laughs> see what I mean? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. How about cardiovascular disease? Well, <laughs> cardiovascular disease, as you know, is the leading cause of death. 600,000 plus per year die as a result of it. Uh, I mentioned 2,300 people per day die as a result of it. American women are 10 times more likely to die of heart disease than they are of breast cancer. Uh, mortality rate from the surprise heart attacks, first heart attacks that people are not expecting. The mortality rate has improved, but yet it's still fatal a third of the time. And this is despite what we do with our current state of management, which is recommending diet, recommending exercise, taking statin medications to lower cholesterol, doing calcium scoring and screens to diagnose or try to screen for heart disease. So the fundamental problem is that these preventive or diagnostic procedures are rather short-term based. Total cholesterol, I mentioned, was not that good at predicting risk of cardiovascular disease, but so what is? Well, what's called lipoproteins. Lipoproteins are the proteins that encase the LDL that goes into the lining of the arteries of the heart and causes the buildup of plaque, the blockages, and ultimately heart attacks, and so on. There's a test for that. It's called APOB. It's a far superior test to just measuring total cholesterol, and even LDL. How many of you had that? Right. So that's an important issue. So there's about um, uh, about, uh, uh, what was that for? Am I supposed to quit now, Hank? Okay. <laughs> Last time Hank gave me multiple signals. When I was getting here to the end, in fact, Hank has more signal, signals than the football coach on the sidelines. <laughs> so, and, and I refused to recognize most of them and kind of went on. So, and, speak. <laughs> I just got through talking about too late. And here we go. Well, uh, you know, um, that, Betsy, so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't have, they're not, there's a couple that are kind of of interest, and there's probably some that aren't, so anyway. Well, while we're doing that, so an, another, yes, Mike. Where do, you, where do you get that test that you just asked us about? Yes, G get it from your doctor's office that has ordered the test. You can request it. Well, so it's part of you know, if you say, well, today we're just going to test your cholesterol levels, you know, your total cholesterol, your LDL, your HDL, and your triglycerides, and that's it. There is a more sophisticated test uh, that's done uh, that includes APOB, includes another factor called LP little a, which is the same thing. LP little a is a cholesterol component and carrier component that's responsible for these acute heart attacks and sudden death that, that you know about. And so what you have to do is say you want a complete lipid analysis. Uh, there's not a specific name to it. Uh, some of the companies that have previously done that don't do it anymore. A lot of it now gets done by the Cleveland Clinic. But you can have the blood drawn in your doctor's office and 
maybe they don't know what you're talking about, um, but um, <laughs> yeah, I guess a bit, yeah, that's a good thought. I guess the best thing to do would be to, um, I don't know how to do this for the, no, there is a total panel. You can look at a, at a sheet, and it gives a total panel of everything that I'm talking about as far as APOB and LP little a in addition to the cholesterol uh, assessment. And so maybe that's the best way on an individual basis. But beyond that, you should be able to go to your physician and say, I don't want just the routine lipid panel. I want the comprehensive, all-inclusive analysis. You know, if that doesn't work, <laughs> then I don't know. You need to... Uh, Ask me, <laughs> and I will get you that. Which I'm yeah, I know, I know. I don't, I don't have that here with me. I, I can't. Well, actually, I have a needle and a syringe here. I'm going to come over. No. <laughs> I have to ask. I have to have blood drawn because of the uh, six-month check at uh, OCSRI. That's the cancer center, and I asked them to do those two tests while they're pulling my blood, and they answered me back that they cannot do that until they get permission from my primary care. <laughs> You see what I mean, Vern? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is. They're, they're not really into that anyway. This they're is. Looking for breast cancer or any cancer, but I just thought I'd try it and then they won't do it. So now I've got to go back to my primary care doctor and ask them. See, it should not be that way. It, it, it should not be where there's obstacles to getting what you need to have done. <laughs> it should be an easy path to get what you need to be done. And this is what I'm talking about um, of the current state of medicine. It's just that. It's just that it's not enough attention paid to early diagnosis, to screening for risk, and so on. Uh, what about calcium scoring scans as a way to assess risk if you have heart disease? Are any of you familiar with that or have had it? A few? Yeah. So I used to think that was a, a really great screening tool. Not so much anymore. And, and here's why. About 15% of people that have normal calcium scoring scans actually have plaque buildup in the arteries of the heart. It's either what's called a soft plaque or it's called uh, even have small calcification. Here's something that's really interesting. Two to three percent of people that have zero, no calcium on a calcium scoring scan actually have, when evaluated by what's called CT angiography, actually have high risk lesions in the arteries or in the artery of their heart. And so I don't think calcium scoring scans are necessarily the best screening tool. Well, so doctor, what is the best screening tool, we might ask. And so <laughs> that is a CT coronary arteriogram. Why is that? Because it actually sees, it actually visualizes the arteries of the heart. Now, now, something interesting, of the new, new things in medicine, there is now an artificial intelligence system, technology associated with that test that can determine more about that plaque to know is it a high risk plaque or is it a low risk plaque? Because that's important to know. Yeah. Treadmill tests are worthless, by the way, in case you don't know that, because treadmill tests just test for the possibility of a 70% blockage or greater. But what if you have a 50% plaque it's a soft plaque that ruptures. Most heart attacks are caused by those kind of plaques. And so you won't find that on a stress test, typical stress test. Well, I could go on and on. But anyway, we'll, st we'll stop at that. Any questions about what I've seen other, other than Mike's question? Yes, sir. No. That's... Yeah, they can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah, they can't code for that. Insurance will not pay for the CT coronary angiogram that I mentioned, and in fact, it's about $6,000. Now, I will tell you one thing, and this is not a plug for our group or so on, but our group once a year, uh, typically in February, which is heart month, the, there's ads in the paper the last few years that we've done this, and that's $500 for a CT coronary angiogram. And some, so some, some of your doctors may say, well, you don't really need that. It'll just show 
with my old plaque of this and that. But, but here's the deal. <laughs> with heart disease, you know, sometimes there's not warnings. 15% of the time, the first time a person is aware that they have heart disease, they're dying of a heart attack. 50% of the time, the first clue that they have heart disease is they're having a heart attack. So 65 times out of 100, the first event is a major event before anybody knows they have a heart disease. Therefore, that's why I'm such a proponent of, <laughs> of trying to be preventive, early diagnosis and so on. Um, now, going back to the lipids, LDL is not inconsequential, don't get me wrong there. The problem here is, is that there are standard recommendations. Uh, these are standard guidelines. Uh, the standard guidelines say if you don't have heart disease or the equivalent, that your number should be 100. If you do have heart disease or the equivalent, it should be 70. But here's the problem. The problem is, is that that doesn't sufficiently cover the need to have the LDL lowered to totally prevent having heart disease. It should be dramatically lowered. It should be like when we were babies. Now, LDL levels then are 20 to 30. Apolipoprotein B, ApoB that I mentioned is 20 to 30. Those are goals. Those are targets if we're really serious about preventing heart disease. I want to talk a minute about um, something else, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Uh, a lot of, lot of research has gone on there. A lot of billions of dollars have been spent uh, tracking down, I'm sure you're familiar with the presence of amyloid plaques, what are called tangles that are present in, in the brains of individuals that have uh, Alzheimer's. And so all the research has been focused on that and with uh, to little avail. I mean, there are, have been, with the exception now of one, there have been no drugs that are effective in delaying the onset of cognitive problems, improving cognitive problems, or so on. Um, it's interesting that um, autopsy studies have shown that about 25% actually of cognitively no normal people will actually have the amyloid plaques. So is it primary cause or secondary cause? Maybe the latter. Um, so can we do anything to prevent the onset of Alzheimer's? There was an interesting study. It was a two-year randomized controlled trial that was done in Finland and found that aggressive interventions, again, diet, nutrition, exercise, physical activity, and cognitive training help maintain cognitive function and prevent cognitive decline uh, in about 1,200 individuals that were in that study. There have been several European trials uh, that found that multiple lifestyle interventions uh, improved cognitive performance in individuals at risk or that had it. So if there was ever, ever a disease that called for early diagnosis and specifically for prevention, Alzheimer's would be that one because there is no effective treatment. There are alternatives to the Alzheimer's uh, plaque, amyloid plaque tangles theory, and it's related to heart disease because many of the factors that cause heart disease are the same factors that cause Alzheimer's. And so what's been found in a high percentage of individuals that have Alzheimer's and have died, there has been found calcification in the arteries to the brain. So that suggests that it may be a blood flow problem. Another study has also looked at what's called the thickness of the carotid artery, the carotid artery of the arteries that supply the brain. And that thickness, increasing thickness, has been associated with cognitive decline. Again, suggesting that it may be a blood flow problem. No one knows for sure, but that's an alternative theory. And so that alternative theory plays into the idea that exercise can be preventive, can be beneficial, because exercise improves the blood flow to the brain. So basically, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So, what about diet? There are 40,000 diet books on Amazon. <laughs> I've read every one of them. 
<laughs> they, guess what? They can't all be right. <laughs> so, so based on what we know now, the, most of the research about nutrition has not been very good. That's why there are 40,000 books about diet on Amazon. Most of the research isn't very good. The best research, or at least the least worst research, has to do with, I know you all know this, the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet is a preventive diet. Uh, there's data, there's evidence to say that it plays a role in preventing heart disease, it plays a role in preventing uh, Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. So if there is one diet that is recommended, that's the one. One other diet that I will mention here briefly is the ketogenic diet. I'm sure some of you have heard of that. Uh, there's some evidence to say that, that that does improve individuals that do have some degree of cognitive impairment. But the single most powerful tool is exercise. Endurance exercise lowers inflammation, which plays a role in this, uh, lowers stress levels, improves blood flow. One thing that gets overlooked is strength training is just as important. And it's interesting that grip strength is a reflection of overall strength, and grip strength is associated with risk for dementia. Okay, the greater the, risk, the grip strength, the less the risk for dementia. The less, the lower the grip strength, the greater the risk for dementia. I'm going to talk about sleep. For those of you that are awake, I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> It's a very powerful tool against dementia. Uh, I'm gonna talk specifically about how to improve sleep, but sleep disruptions and poor sleep are potential drivers of increased risk for dementia. Hearing loss is also associated with, as well as uh, uh, dental health. So, the preventive strategy, as I mentioned, is what's good for the heart is, is good for the brain. Talk a little bit about exercise here to be a little bit more specific, but it has the greatest power, the greatest power to determine how you will live out the rest of your life. There are reams of data, as I said before, that say exercise is helpful in preventing the onset of these chronic diseases that I'm talking about, heart disease, cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, and metabolic dysfunction, study after study shows that regular exercisers live a decade longer than sedentary people and also the health span is dramatically improved. The fittest people that are measured by a special test uh, that's done with exercise training have, um, of the least fit people have about four times, four times the risk of dying or developing one of these diseases I'm talking about. Uh, the least fit category, uh, or the greatest fitness category have a redu reduction in risk, and it's a dose-dependent response. The more, the greater the level of fitness, the greater the benefit in terms of these things that we're trying to prevent. Well, muscle mass, how about muscle mass and muscle strength? Not so much talked about, but it's clearly, it's powerfully correlated with living longer. There was a 10-year observational study of about um, 4,500 people between the ages of or at age 50 or above and found that those with lower muscle mass, lower strength, were at a 40 to 50% greater risk of mortality, of dying, than the controls. When subjects with a low muscle strength were at double the risk. What's interesting is that, as we all know and experience, physical activity and muscle mass decrease as we get older. By age 80, the average person will have lost about 40% of their muscle mass and their strength. We lose it two to three times, we lose muscle strength two to three times uh, more quickly than we lose muscle mass. Inactivity, of course, leads to a reduction in muscle mass and muscle activity. So the point of all of this is that um, strength training is just as important as aerobic exercise, and we're talking about exercise uh, prevention. Falls, falls, some of you in this room have experienced that or in this class have experienced that, but they're the leading cause of accidental deaths in those individuals 
of age 65 or greater. Uh, and that doesn't count those that have a serious fall and then three, six, 12 months later uh, experience death often associated with a long and uncomfortable decline. 800,000 people are hospitalized every year as a result of falls. Falls happen because of decline in muscle mass, problem with balance, all these things occur as we age. How about bone mineral density? Important, very important. It's just as important as muscle mass. Bone mineral density can be checked, should be checked, every few years. Uh, mortality from a hip fracture, a femur fracture, is staggering, and it varies depending on what study you read. Uh, those folks have gone to exercise, I and mean, it's great, they're just kind of picking up on things. Anyways, 15 to 36 percent of individuals that have sustained a hip fracture, a femur fracture, will die within a year. So, what about back to exercise? Exercise Benefits everything, it helps your memory, helps your learning ability, reduces the risk of all these diseases that I'm talking about. So how much to exercise? What to do and how much to exercise? Well, the standard recommendation has been about 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise on a weekly basis. That has been the standard. You'll be amazed to know that 28% of Americans actually exercise according to those guidelines. So it's not enough to stand up here and preach about, <laughs> about the importance of all this. It's not enough for people to be aware of it. There's something else that seems to be missing in terms of stimulating people to embark on an exercise program. There was a study that just came out this week that interestingly evaluated over 100 different studies regarding exercise and about 20 to 30 million people. So it's quite substantial in terms of the value of this study. And it said 75 minutes a week is adequate to reduce the risk of all these diseases that I'm talking about. So it's a situation where people say, well, I can't do that. I can't do 150 minutes a week and on and on, but you can do 75. You know, if you do anything, it's a value. And it's about mindset. You know, having the right mindset. You know, it's interesting, the study was done among college students, and they were advised regarding exercise, but they were given very flexible criteria. We didn't preach about uh, the benefit of exercise on health and so on. And lo and behold, they exercised more than a control group that were given the more rigid criteria. So mindset, approaching exercise as though it might be something that's pleasurable, beneficial, rather than boring and painful. Uh, I think, uh, so establishing the right mindset toward exercise creates greater adherence to making exercise a uh, part of your lifestyle. I've talked about nutrition, I've talked about the Mediterranean diet, uh, protein, important. Obviously, absence of protein leads to the decline in the muscle mass and muscle strength that I mentioned, and the daily recommendations put out by the government are a joke. They're not anywhere close to what needs to be done. The recommendation is about one gram per pound of weight per day. Fats, fats are a source of fuel, building blocks. You need to substitute unhealthy fats with healthy fats. You know, I think a, a, a quick summation of nutrition is bad nutrition can hurt us more than good nutrition can help us. There is what's been called the longevity diet. Specifically, the longevity diet uh, is number one, limit caloric intake to where you maintain a body mass index of 22 to 23 for men, 21 to 22 for women, number two, Eat a diet high in whole grains, legumes, beans, etc., and nuts. Stop eating meat, but include some fish. Number three, aim to get 45 to 60 percent of the calories from non-refined complex carbohydrates. Do a limited daily fast. You know, eat no calories from about three hours before retiring for the night 
until about uh, 11 to 12 hours from the last meal. Um, I do that every day. Every two to three months, this longevity diet recommends five days of complete fasting. So just to let you know, there's not a lot of data yet about the longevity diet, but it is being recognized as potentially being able to play a role. So let's talk about sleep. I'm very good at putting people to sleep with these talks, so <laughs> that's a value here. Well, sleep, yes, star. You say eat no meat, including fish? No, eat no meat, but include fish, sorry, yeah. The main thing about the, yeah, let will go back to the diet just a minute. Something that was really interesting that I forgot to mention. So there was this great study that was done in addition to the Mediterranean study, there was a study done in Spain. And it was a very well designed study. And so what they did was they gave one group of individuals a gallon of olive oil and told to consume that olive oil in their meals and food and so on during the week. They gave another group nuts. And they were told to eat one ounce of nuts a week. The third group was told to follow a low-fat diet. Well, lo and behold, the group that had the olive oil and the group that had the nuts had about a 28 to 30 percent reduction in the occurrence of heart disease, Alzheimer's, and all these diseases that I'm talking about, and interestingly had improvement in cognitive performance. That was both the olive oil plus where it's dramatically better than a low-fat diet just in case you've been advised to be on a low-fat diet. So, many studies have found there is a powerful, powerful association between insufficient sleep, which means less than seven hours a night, and adverse health comes, outcomes, health comes, outcomes, health outcomes. <laughs> Poor sleep dramatically increases the propensity for the metabolic dysfunction. Uh, good sleep, not just quantity, but quality is critical for our cognitive function, our memory, our emotional equilibrium. And there's a growing body of evidence that says good sleep, appropriate sleep, sleeping well is essential, essential to improving and preserving our cognition as we age and staving off Alzheimer's disease. Every single night of bad sleep has been found to have deleterious effects on both our mental health and our physical health. Poor sleep affects our metabolism. Nine different studies have shown that sleep abnormalities, poor sleep is associated with increasing insulin resistance, which is a harbinger, as I mentioned before, of metabolic dysfunction, by about a third, which is one of the most consistent of all sleep findings. Long sleep is also a problem. Uh, too much sleep is a problem. 11 hours or greater is associated with poor health, but I think most people don't do that. So, sleeping less than six hours is associated with a 20% risk of a heart attack. Sleeping six to nine hours a night uh, is shown to reduce the risk of a heart attack. Uh, deep sleep, REM sleep, important because that's when the brain rather heals itself, it flushes out the cerebral spinal fluid, flushes out um, the toxic products that build up during the day, flushes out short-term memory that's not important but helps to preserve short-term and long-term memory in the hippocampus of the brain that is important. So having deep sleep, having REM sleep is important for learning and memory. Well, insomnia is not uncommon. It affects about 30 to 50 percent of adults in the United States of America, and sleep disorders seem to increase as we get older, as we age. Uh, sleep disorders often precede the onset of dementia by a few to s several years. So superior sleep quality in adults is associated with uh, lower risk of developing mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's, and maintaining a higher level of cognitive function. So successfully treating sleep disturbance may delay the onset of Alzheimer's by 11 years or so on. Again, expanding what I've talked about as far as the health span. Clearly sleep and cognitive health are intertwined and it's one of the pillars of preventing Alzheimer's disease is appropriate sleep. So how do you sleep better? 
There are multiple, as you know, sleep medications on the market. There's about a dozen approved sleep medications on the market. It's a $28 billion a year industry. These sleep medications, Ambien, um, Lunesta, and so on, what they do is, is they promote a state of unconsciousness. They don't promote REM, they don't promote deep sleep, they don't promote healthy sleep. It's a sleep-like state of unconsciousness. And it doesn't really accomplish much, if any, of the brain healing work that's necessary. There are a couple of newer medications that seem to have some promise. Uh, one drug that is helpful is trazodone. Uh, that has been shown to improve sleep architecture. Um, there is a supplement that has multiple names. It's called Indian ginseng or winter cherry and so on that has some promise, although again, not a lot of research done on that. Before I get the question, I will address the marijuana gummies because that is being utilized. And so that's an unknown. You know, I don't really have a strong opinion about that. Uh, there are not sufficient studies about that. There are concerns. As with any marijuana product, the obvious concern is that of habituation. Continuing to take it chronically leads to habituation, which when discontinued, leads to sleep problems, sleep disturbances, and so on. So uh, there are concerns about it. It may or may not be helpful. Uh, it appears, though, to interfere with the REM sleep and deep sleep uh, that's important for the brain healing itself. Um, so, well, how do you non-medically get uh, good sleep? So there are several steps that have been uh, with you and uh, see if we can help. The first requirement is darkness. Darken the room completely so that you can't even see the hand in front of your face. The bedroom has to be cool, should be cool for better sleep. What does cool mean? 65 degrees. Avoid bright or LED lights prior to sleep. Avoiding, avoid stimulating electronics. Don't eat anything three hours before going to, to bed. A hot marijuana can sometimes be helpful. It's sort of counterintuitive, but in a way, if you experience an increase in body temperature, then when you're exposed to 65 degrees, that transition seems to promote sleep. Uh, avoid anxiety-producing activities, uh, uh, such as uh, emails and watching the news and that type of thing. Uh, fix and maintain wake-up time consistent time so that you don't have to worry about that. And final recommendation is don't obsess over sleep. That just makes things worse. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, it. Um, any questions about anything I've said up to this point? Because I'm going to leave some time for questions. Amazingly, Hank, you can put your signals away. <laughs> so, so. No questions? Great. Oh, Mike. Yeah, um, not a lot of, first off, not a lot of data about it. The data that is present says that uh, it's a good and bad thing. <laughs> it, it may be fine to do it. It refreshes you during the day. It removes you from the environment, and so that's beneficial. It's not beneficial if it interferes with nighttime sleep. You know, people, sometimes people nap too much and then they can't sleep at night. So that's sort of the downside. I don't have any studies like I've talked about with sleep and preventing heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, and metabolic dysfunction. I don't have any studies about that. So my comments are very limited. Yeah, I don't, you know, again, I don't know. I don't think there's data to say, you know, during a nap, do those healthy things that occur in the brain happen? The cleansing, the removal of the toxic substance, the removal of amyloid and tau and so on. Do those things happen during nap? I doubt it, but I don't know for sure. 
So I don't, probably not answering your question directly because I just don't know. I don't think there's a data to say. I think what you experience is valid. I mean, if, if you have a 15, 30 minute nap and you're good to go right after that, then that's probably beneficial. Uh, what, would, what the question would be is, well, then is that 30 minutes interfering with your ability to get seven hours of sleep at night? And so that's something you have to experiment with. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think so. I mean, a lot of these diseases have some hereditary component to them. I mean, clearly Alzheimer's does, particularly early, on, on, early onset Alzheimer's does. Uh, that's the genetic DNA basis for that. A small percentage of uh, heart disease is, uh, for sure. Small percentage of cancer is. So yes, there are genetic in influences in all of these um, um, diseases that I'm talking about. However, however, the vast majority of these diseases are caused by lifestyle issues, by environmental and lifestyle issues. You know, we always used to say with heart disease, well, genetics kind of loads the gun, but your lifestyle pulls the trigger. Mark. Great question, Mark. And by the way, you are the only person that adheres to these. In fact, you're considered an outlier in the group. That's a, no, but that's a great question, and the answer is yes. I can tell. I can, I can tell you specifically, I have seen it uh, in terms of the heart, in terms of coronary artery disease, in terms of the, the buildup of plaque in the arteries of the heart. I have seen individuals that have aggressively adopted these measures that I'm talking about, nutrition, exercise, and so on, and they have had l l reversal. So if they start out with, let's say, 60% narrowing in an artery of their heart, it may go down to 20 or 30 percent or go away. I have actually seen arteriograms that show that, so I know that. Uh, the answer is yes uh, to, of course, cancer, that's in itself. If you can't, once it's established, <laughs> you can't undo it. That will not reverse itself. What about the cognitive issues? Uh, there's some evidence to say that it, it can reverse itself. I'm not sure it goes back to normal, but I think if there are mild cognitive impairment, there's evidence to say that, yes, that can be reversed. So that's a long way to answer your question to, yes, there is reversal. Yes? Oh, sure, yeah. Well, it's a little bit out of the realm of, uh, of all these diseases that I'm talking about. I mean, that's a disease in itself that clearly has a genetic basis to it, that's true. It causes symptoms, uh, you know, for sure. I mean, if you have lactose in your diet, you will have the symptoms that occur as a result of that diarrhea and abdominal discomfort. But I don't think it's a risk factor for any of these diseases that I'm talking about. Meredith, I think, yeah, you had a question. Oh, yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, the question is about the CT coronary angiogram arteriogram that I mentioned as the most accurate way to diagnose the presence or prove the absence of coronary artery disease. That is a non invasive test, meaning catheters aren't put into your circulation. It's done by you have an IV put in. 
you have, do have dye that it's injected and you go to, into a scanner. Uh, it's minimal to no risk, uh, highly accurate, uh, takes about an hour to do of time to get it set up and get the test done. Uh, there's some interesting components to it uh, that we do in that if you find that there is a blockage, let's say find that there's a 60% blockage, does that limit blood flow or not? We have a software program that will evaluate whether it limits blood flow or not. So this, the test itself, outpatient test, non-invasive, minimal to no risk, highly accurate, highly informative. Does that help explain it? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, in my garage, I have. <laughs> so you get it at a major institution. I mean, for instance, I know we do it. Oklahoma Heart Institute does it. We do it at, at the Heart Hospital. St. Francis does it. Um, you have to be sure. This is the other thing I want to Going back to last week's talk, you know, I've just, just learned some examples of that. Uh, but some of these um, private equity firms and corporate firms, they don't reinvest in the equipment. So some hospitals don't have equipment that's state-of-the-art or up-to-date. I can tell you about ours. I can tell you I think St. Francis is clearly up-to-date. I wouldn't, wouldn't count on Ascension. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Usually, there, usually, there's an ad that goes into the uh, paper and announcement about that, so you can watch for that. If not, you can ask me. I mean, you can call call up our number, uh, so on. I'm starting to. Lisa, were you going to ask? No. I was going to ask a question. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, a great thought, and, and I uh, should have included that more, <laughs> more in the, I'm getting one of these. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's okay, I, I, I ignore him, you know, I, I, he got to, he's got to get to the big signs before, before I go away. So, so, yes, there is evidence to say that, that people that, for instance, attend church, they have lower risk of heart disease for sure, uh, metabolic dysfunction, and so on. Now, the problem with all that is, that the data that's come out of that is, is what's called confounding influences. In other words, are healthier people more likely to go to church than, than not? And so that's why I didn't get into it a whole lot. But in general, spirituality, meditation, yoga. Yoga is beneficial for the heart. I, will, I, I know that, I'll say that. Those things generally are beneficial for health. Yeah. Okay. Can I squeeze in one more? I think all the stuff you're telling us for our age group and our class is very important, but what I took from my research in that was you gotta tell our kids. My 40 year old son, he needs to be doing calcium. I actually did a glucose monitor on him when I was there last and they need to be looking at because they're they can maybe really prevent it if they start with the forty. Yeah, well, yeah, or even before. Here's something I didn't say. So, well, when does heart disease start? When does the plaque buildup start? Well, it actually starts in teenage years and, and uh, in the 20s. Fatty streaks are seen in arteries of the heart, for instance, in, in young individuals that have been killed in war, Vietnam War, and so on. Autopsy studies have shown that they already have, about a third of them already had, the development of it. I mean, it's a disease of our society. It need not be, you know, it should not be the number one killer. It should be 10th. If we do all these things, if we get the APOB, if we get it down to 20 to 30, if we do all these things, it could be prevented. Anyway, I'm pretty much done. Any other? <laughs>